Let others complain that the age is wicked. My complaint is that it is wretched, for it lacks passion. Men's thoughts are thin and flimsy like lace. They are themselves pitiable, like the lace makers. The thoughts of their hearts are too paltry to be sinful. For a worm, it might be regarded as a sin to harbor such thoughts, but not for a being made in the image of God. And this is the reason why my soul always turns back to the Old Testament and to Shakespeare. I feel that those who speak there are at least human beings. They hate, they love, they murder their enemies and curse their descendants throughout all generations. They sin. Is it true that we live in a pathologically mediocre society where people are thin and flimsy, aggregates of human qualities instead of actual human beings, a society like Kierkegaard describes? If time permitted, we could perhaps go about it methodically in doing a historical behavioral evaluation. We could compare the behavior and accomplishments of the modern man and woman with the average person who came before us. We could, for example, argue that the housewife of ages past who raised and taught children was objectively a more excellent person than the single woman of today who raises fur babies, all other things of course being equal. Based on metrics of consequences, the supposedly patriarchally oppressed woman of the past had a more meaningful life than the liberated career woman of today pushing paperwork and setting schedules in offices. But since time and attention spans are so short nowadays, I'll put off my methodical research for a rainy day. For now, I will limit myself to a kind of argument that is very rare nowadays. I will simply appeal to your conscience. I will ask you to be honest with yourself. Do you feel that you have a strong or a weak personality? Are the people of our society, the people who are surrounding you, strong or weak personalities? Does your conscience whisper to you, perhaps in the words of Friedrich Nietzsche, saying, there are no personalities to be seen, let alone free personalities, nothing but anxiously muffled up identical people. Are there still human beings, one then asks oneself, or perhaps only thinking, writing, and speaking machines? If you can honestly say to yourself that we are living in a great society with truly great individuals, then you don't need to waste your time with this video. If you can say that the millennial generation and Generation X, the boomers and Gen Z, if you can say that they are all excellent people by and large, as great or greater than those who came before us, if you can honestly say that, this essay will be of no benefit to you. For myself, I do think that we have a problem of weak personalities, of soy boys and snowflakes, of people who are too easily triggered shaken to the core by events that really do not matter all that much. We are bothered by little things, and we do not employ ourselves in meaningful tasks. We are hesitant to pass on our genes. We do not craft items that will remain in our families for centuries. We do not plant the trees in whose shade we shall never sit. We do not live lives that others will be proud of. We do not leave legacies. I am writing this essay because I implicate myself in this mediocrity. I too am a child of this age and I feel in myself the weak personality of my generation, but I want to overcome it. And this may be why, like so many others, I am drawn to Friedrich Nietzsche. In one of his less famous works, Untimely Meditations, Nietzsche tackles the problem of mediocrity that in his eyes was plaguing 19th century German society. According to Nietzsche, this problem of weak personalities is due in part to a loss of a proper sense of history. History is a fundamental human need, psychologically speaking. Without it, our bodies go on living, but our spirits, so to speak, wither and die. We need history, says Nietzsche, but we need it for reasons different from those for which the idler in the garden of knowledge needs it, even though he may look nobly down on our rough and charmless needs and requirements. We need it 
that is to say, for the sake of life and action, not so as to turn comfortably away from life and action. Life needs history, and without history, there is an abatement of life, a diminishing of life. Specifically, Nietzsche identifies three areas where life needs history, which correspond to three uses that history has for life, a monumental use, an antiquarian use, and a critical use. The latter two I will discuss in other videos. For this video, we are going to focus on a monumental view of history, because this is the kind of history that engenders life and divines it, which is to say, it discovers life, it gives supernatural insight into life. Monumental history, according to Nietzsche, looks on history as a monument to the great actions and important events surrounding notable people. It pertains to man as a being who acts and strives. History belongs above all to the man of deeds and power, to him who fights a great fight, who needs models, teachers, comforters, and cannot find them among his contemporaries. Monumental history records the great deeds and events of the past, and through it we hear the call of greatness, beckoning us on to attempt great things. Of what use then is the monumentalist conception of the past, engagement with the classic and the rare of earlier times to the man of the present? He learns from it that the greatness that once existed was in any event once possible, and may thus be possible again. He goes his way with a more cheerful step, for the doubt which assailed him in weaker moments whether he was not perhaps desiring the impossible, has now been banished. So we look back, for example, at the Renaissance, and according to Nietzsche, we can see that its entire cultural revolution was raised on the shoulders of a band of a hundred men, educated and striving in a new spirit, and we gain hope and strength from this fact, realizing that with a large classroom full of such individuals, we could do the same thing. So if a man or woman wants to do something great, he or she appropriates the past by means of monumental history. And to this end, we need to learn to see history differently, in a really profound way. Our friends in psychology tell us that when we look at a cliff, we don't see a cliff, we see a falling off point. We see it as a meaningful thing before we see it as an objective thing. Similarly, when we look at history, we shouldn't see the raw facts of past events. Rather, we should see potential, potential for our own futures. We should see those events meaningfully rather than objectively. This is how Soren Kierkegaard frames it in his pseudonymous work, Concluding Unscientific Postscript. Instead of presenting the good in the form of actuality, as is ordinarily done, that this person and that person have actually lived and have actually done this, and thus transforming the reader into an observer, an admirer, an appraiser. It should be presented in the form of possibility. Then, whether or not the reader wants to exist in it, is placed as close to him as possible. Now don't let that abstract language trip you up. Kierkegaard is simply saying that we shouldn't be turned into people who are merely observers of the past, or admirers of it, or appraisers of it. Although, unfortunately, when it comes to history, this is exactly what our universities have done, along with our documentaries and even other YouTube channels who focus on history. They present history as something to merely observe, merely admire, to find interesting, or to appraise, or criticize, or analyze. Instead, according to Kierkegaard, history should be presented as a possibility for our lives, a possibility that we can step into. The question is, when you are looking at history, do you want to exist in this? The fact that someone else did something means that we ourselves could also potentially do the same. So, the question is, are you going to do it? Are you going to get off your couch? Are you going to put down your phone? Are you going to lead? Are you going to write the next great classic? Are you going to craft 
the next masterpiece? Are you going to settle the frontier? Are you going to lead the next movement? Are you going to go into the wilderness as the next mystic? Drawing on the historian Plutarch, Kierkegaard says that we should be like the Athenian general Themistocles, who, when he saw the greatness of another Athenian general, Miltiades, in the victory at the Battle of Marathon, Plutarch tells us Themistocles could not sleep because he was so tortured, he so desperately wanted to be like Miltiades. Plutarch writes, It is said, indeed, that Themistocles was so carried away by his desire for reputation, and such an ambitious lover of great deeds, that though he was still a young man when the battle with the barbarians at Marathon was fought, and the generalship of Miltiades was in everybody's mouth, he was seen thereafter to be wrapped in his own thoughts for the most part, and was sleepless of the nights, and refused invitations to his customary drinking parties, and said to those who put wondering questions to him concerning his change of life, that the trophy of Miltiades would not suffer him to sleep. And so what did Themistocles do? Well, he didn't remain content with dreaming. He didn't pine his life away. Instead, while the rest of his countrymen thought that the Battle of Marathon was the end of the wars with Persia, he believed it was just the beginning. And Plutarch says he anointed himself, as it were, to be the champion of all Helos, and put his city into training, because while it was yet afar off, he expected the evil that was to come. So Themistocles inspired the Athenians to build a navy of 200 triremes, and led that navy to defeat the next Persian invasion at the Battle of Salamis, halting the expansion of the Persian Empire, and ensuring that history would not be very different from what it is. So the question is, where do we fit into all of this? How do we start to counteract the mediocrity of our generation? First of all, we need to learn history. When we look at societies of the past, I think we will find that what set them apart from us, at least in part, is that they were far more aware of their pasts than we are. We know from cringy man on the street interviews that our ignorance of history is abysmal. We learn only by imitation. Acting the way we see others acting, we only become so great as the models we have. And without models, we do not know how to act. We do not even know what we are capable of. If we are ignorant of history, then we are ignorant of what human beings, and indeed we, ourselves, are capable of. That is the first step. Secondly, we need to learn to see those past people and events as possibilities for ourselves. Both Nietzsche and Kierkegaard recognized that mere head knowledge could just as easily make us less active instead of more active if we allow ourselves merely to be observers and collectors of facts. As Kierkegaard wrote in his journal, there are no longer human beings, thinkers, lovers. The human race is enveloped by the press in a miasma of thoughts, emotions, moods, and even conclusions, intentions which are nobodies, which belong to none and yet to all. My goodness, if only Kierkegaard could have seen social media. We have so much information that we cannot act. So part of the process is ignoring a lot of the information that we have, learning to be forgetful so that we can focus on the history that is useful for us, and to make that history into a possibility for us. While history can be the head of a Medusa that freezes us, it can also be the face of a Helen that launches a thousand ships in pursuit. The people of the past had a different species of awareness of their stories than we do. Instead of a dispassionate objectivity, they had a reverence for the past. They had clear heroes and villains, and most importantly, they looked to the past for examples to follow. This was true not just of the few noteworthy men that history records, men like Napoleon following Hannibal's footsteps across the Alps, or Virgil following Homer, or Dante following Virgil, but history affected everyday people. My own country of America was built on the hope of the self-made man, 
that was recorded in the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, people daring to do what one man had done before, believing that a man could go from having absolutely nothing to being a founding father. It's hard for us to appreciate just how alive men like Washington and Franklin were in the imaginations of Americans of the 19th century. Those early Americans fed themselves on the myths of frontiersmen like Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett. Though not many now remember the Alamo, many did and were profoundly moved, literally moved to go west and seek a life on the frontier, fighting and working and building. Men like Andrew Jackson, for all his very real flaws, inspired ideals of manliness and bravery, often with very bad consequences. But to go back to the quote from Kierkegaard that I started this essay with, at least they were human. At least they lived. They murdered and they cursed their descendants. But they were humans. If we look at our money and we wonder why these men's images are on our dollar bills, it is because we have forgotten history. And because history is no longer possibility to us. And so it is no wonder that we are mediocre, that we have weak personalities. We do not have examples of greatness in the present that we might follow, and we do not have knowledge of past greatness, nor a sense of inspiration or obligation to step into that greatness, wherever we might be in life. Going back to the idea of everyday greatness, which I think is the kind of greatness that we are looking to inculcate, it would be a gross oversight to ignore the connection between the profound religiosity of the past and an ethical historical sense. The two go hand in hand. Being religious meant that for centuries, the Christian West had a profound memorized consciousness of a past recorded in the Old and New Testaments and a traditional history of martyrs and saints. Other religions, of course, have their own histories. The important thing is that participation in a religion almost always calls us not just to be an excellent person, but gives us a historical map of how to do so. Follow my example, the Apostle Paul writes. Be like Christ. Be the complete, fulfilled human. With a loss of religion, we lose a vast collection of of historical stories calling us to greatness. A vast collection that our predecessors had, but we do not. And so we are forced with looking for a replacement. For if we do not have that replacement, if we do not have a monumental history, we become paltry, thin people. We must download into our brains a vast collection of examples from the greatest men and women who have ever lived. We must program possibility into us by way of a variety of life maps. Instead of having a framework for life that is limited to paying bills, playing video games, watching sports, being a social media influencer, crying to the bachelor, the historically minded person has a pantheon of lived lives before him. Philosophers, desert mystics, Conquerors, generals, kings, statesmen, queens, rebels, dissenters, poets, writers, peasant heroes, lovers, sailors, explorers, entrepreneurs, sufferers, and martyrs. The person who knows history has many potential selves, and the person who acts decisively in his own situation, tailoring the past to fit his present, acting as men before him acted to be an architect of the future, that man gains an actuality that is greater than his contemporaries. He looks upon the monuments of the past and carves a new monument into the present out of the form of his own life and the material of his own body. The past must come to life in us, planted not in our minds, but in our souls. And yet I seem to have forgotten that no one is supposed to believe in a soul anymore. It's not scientific. Indeed, it is difficult to prove the existence of a soul when no one takes the trouble 
to make one in himself. So I'm curious to hear what you guys think. Uh, do you think that our generation is uh, weaker than previous generations? I assume if you made it this far, you probably agree that we're not everything that we probably should be. And although history is a very important part to restoring us to full humanity, so to speak, I think there are other things that we need to uh, recapture, and I'm interested to hear what you guys think about the subject. The great thing about dialogue and dialectics is that what one person says inspires things in other people that I could never have imagined or thought up on my own, so I want to hear what you guys thought about this. Please, by all means, hit me up in the comments or on social media. I am currently in the process of making videos fairly regularly, so if you want more like this, then subscribe and like the video if you want to help promote it. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you around.